and clicker. Clicker? Clicker? Do we have a clicker? Not clicker. Okay, well. Uh, yeah, yeah, that would be great. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I want to thank the uh, organizers for the uh, opportunity to uh, to be here. Uh, as uh, as uh, Daniel said, I have recently uh, left the University of Washington and Deco here to uh, Google. Uh, so if I make any mistakes, it's because I've been writing Java code solid for five months and, and my brain's completely wired different now. Um, so anyways, it's good to see familiar faces here. It's also good to see not familiar because that means there are young people who are going to do really exciting things. Uh, today I want to talk about uh, uh, codes for, for local virus, but before I do that, I, I want to thank not just the organizers, but I also want to thank... Uh, click. I want to thank this technology. I'll stand up here. Uh, I want to thank Daniel for the invitation to come here. Uh, my first paper that I ever wrote was in, in quantum computing was in 1999. I wrote a paper in the Journal of Geology before that. Uh, and this is that paper from uh, 1999. And what's great about this paper, you can't tell here, but this is in the era when I bold-faced every operator. And I'd write them with a little Feynman thing. And so all of our operators in our early papers are bold-faced. It's just disgusting. Uh, but luckily, I think we overcame that difficulty. Um, but I, the, other th the other thing I'd like to bring up is I, I'll never forgive Daniel for uh, one particular thing about that period of, of, of my life, which is that when I was in grad school, uh, in a time, if you go back to the very beginning of Daniel's publication list, you might see that there's a different person listed, Daniel A. Lidar Hamburger. Of course, my last name is Bacon. Right before we published this paper, he stopped using it. We could have had a Bacon Hamburger paper. And so I'll never forgive him for not allowing me to have a bacon hamburger paper. If there's anybody in the audience that has a food item as a last name and they want to write a paper together, talk to me. We can write something and, and it'll be great. Okay, so what I want to talk about today. So I want to talk about uh, quantum error correction and I want to talk about uh, uh, how to make it local. Okay, so I mean spatially local uh, in a nice way. Okay, so here's our quantum error correct, a quantum error correcting circuit. Uh, you know, you have time running from left to right here. I do some Hadamards up there. If you look closely, you can probably see the creation of some cats down at the bottom, uh, and then some measurement going on. And this is just one big, small portion of, of the air correcting routine, which, uh, which we all know. Now, the question I want to talk about is how to fit this thing in an experimentalist box. This poor cat doesn't quite fit. Um, and in particular, I want to think about the problems of this fact that we're going to have to lay this thing out on some, say, 2D architecture, maybe 3D if you're really ambitious. Uh, and in particular, this seems kind of daunting. So here's uh, one of the very first, uh, not the first, but one of the, very, or one of the first uh, stabilizer codes ever, dis ever discovered. This is the STEAM code. Um, and remember the error correcting procedure. What you do is you, for, for stabilizer codes is you measure these operators. Uh, you measure the, uh, you know, you do a, a measurement which tries, tries to project onto the plus one or minus one eigenvalues of these stabilizer operators. And then given those measurements, you can diagnose the error and correct it if you want to. Uh, and in the STEAM code, those operators are like S1. They have identity, so you don't touch the first three qubits, say. Uh, and then there's a poly Z on the last four, right? And then they're laid out like, and if you think about this, you know, these are, these are measurements that you're trying to, pr to, to, to achieve of this four qubit operation. Uh, and this is, you know, a, a little bit hard to do uh, when you try to lay this on some substrate. Thank you, laser. Sweet. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you look at the Steen code and you know anything about the history of the Steen code, you might know that it, it fits kind of nicely on uh, what looks like a flattened cube, right? So, you know, there's a face here and there's a face here and there's a face here. And these measurements can be made to maybe sort of around those faces. So at a, at a first order, it's kind of nice in the sense that while these are four qubit operations you have to measure, and we have to use ancillas to do this, et cetera, right? But, but they are sort of at least laid out nicely, right? But the traditional way that we get towards a threshold in fault-tolerant quantum computing is to take that code and then concatenate it, right? And of course, there are other ways to do that, and one of the ways I'm going to talk about, hopefully, is, is, is something today. But if we concatenate the Steen code, here I've done it out in all its painful glory. Thank God for cut and paste. 
um, you know, you have to measure these stabilizer operators, which not only increase in weight, right? So this is this uh, four qubit one here. Right now we have three times four, right? So we have 12 qubit operations. But they start to get spread out even further, right? So I have to measure, you know, qubits that are sort of across, you know, this, you know, part of here and part of here and part of here and part of here. And it grows and it grows. And this isn't a fundamental barrier, but it's kind of annoying, especially if you're going to actually try to lay this out on in any sort of reasonable architecture. Okay. So this one really worries me. The cat uh, should appear slightly larger in here, and it's just getting worse and worse and worse, the poor cat. Oh, yeah, and I put in another picture of a fat cat because, well, we need more fat cats. So, okay, so that's, that's sort of the, sta the situation for concatenated codes. As, they, as you concatenate more and more, you know, the me measurement operations you have to do get bigger and bigger, and while that's not a fundamental barrier and they're nice tricks to get around this, it starts to get kind of uh, daunting. But there are some rays of hope. Uh, uh, and in particular, the codes that we have come to understand are very nice in this respect are uh, surface codes. And here what you do is you, instead of measuring these, you know, instead of doing this concatenated structure, you have a code whose uh, syndrome operators are more naturally local, okay? So we have these plaquette and vertex operators, these four qubit operators that you measure. They're all sort of very close together and nice, and you can imagine, you know, there's just a little part of your hardware that does each of these different measurements. Uh, and you have to worry about fault tolerance and stuff in this, but, but this is a very now well-developed and, and there's lots of amazing work going on studying this. Um, so this is Rays of Hope. Uh, and, but what we'd really like to do is find other codes that are like this, right? Okay, so I'm going to make some definitions just so I can say some things that are sound rigorous, but these are really just definitions that most of you uh, or many of you know. Uh, so I'm going to call things S-local and S-neighboring. So weight of a poly operator is just the number of, uh, you know, when you write out a poly operator like this guy right here, it's the number of these uh, uh, operators which are not identity. So this is a weight five operator here, right? That's the weight, sort of the size of it. And then we're going to say something's an S local code, right? So S local code, if there are a set of stabilizer generators whose weight's less than or equal to S. So the surface code that I taught, said on the previous slide has, has, uh, is four local. Okay, now this is using this, definition of local that computer scientists like, this doesn't have anything to do with spatial locality at this point, right? This just means that they have weight four, okay? They could be weight two over here and weight two over here, okay? So at this point, that, that has nothing to do with, with any sort of locality. What we're lo really looking for is what I'll call S neighboring uh, in D dimensions, which is that you have some sort of regular lattice. It doesn't have to be, you know, you can fudge around it however you want to actually define it. But you have some nice sort of structure uh, that allows you to define some, something like a lattice, right? Uh, and then you're looking about the, you know, you want to know sort of what the size of that radius is on that lattice that that operator operates on. And that's, that's what I'll call S neighboring. So they're all within a distance S. And I'm just leaving the vague definition of distance just because it doesn't really matter. The surface code, for example, if you put it on a lat the correct lattice, can be made to be two neighboring in 2D. This is really what we're after in terms of codes that we like in terms of spatial locality, is, is low S neighboring, so constant, two, three, four. OK, so this is the Mr. Rogers lament. Uh, I don't think I ever heard him say a negative word, but here he is. He's going to say, why can't all the codes be S neighboring in two or three spatial dimensions? So why, why, you know, why can't we find codes that are very much like the surface code? And we have examples of codes like that, color codes, et cetera. Um, and what I'm going to show you today is a new or a class of codes uh, that are uh, very much in line with that, uh, um, with that type of code uh, that's, that's S local for some constant S. Okay. So here's the main result. It says that, that you take some code, some stabilizer code. It can be a subsystem code, but let's just ignore that right now. So you have n qubits, physical qubits, right? You're going to encode k qubits into there. And then this code has a distance d, right? This is the weight of the uh, operator, the smallest weight, right, that does something non-trivial on the, the encoded space, right? Uh, and the, the theorem says that for every such code, you can turn it into a new code. That new code has some, some properties that are nice. So first of all, there's a bad property, which is that now instead of, you know, I have an original code with n qubits, little n, it's going to turn into big N, where big N is of order n squared. Okay, so you get a buttload more uh, uh, qubits, for want of a, a more technical term. Um, and what's nice about this code, so, so there's another thing here, is there's a new parameter here. So this means this is a subsystem code, and I'll explain what that means in a second. 
Um, uh, and there's some new gauge qubits here. So the good things are that, that the, the distance of the code is the same and the number of encoded qubits is the same as this original code. But what's really nice about this new code is that it's spatially local. It's S neighboring for some S constant. You can say S is three. You can, you can always do that at the cost of making N bigger. Um, but you know, S can be three or four, okay? in greater than one dimension. So you can always take, you have some code, it doesn't have any spatial structure, it's like that concatenated code, right? I can take that code and I can turn it into a code which is spatially local, okay? And that's nice because that might help us when we're trying to actually lay this out on a real architecture. And this makes Mr. Rogers very happy. Okay, so how do we understand this code? So what do we need in order to get there? So we need stabilizer subsystem codes. So if you know stabilizer codes, this isn't too bad. Uh, we're going to do measurement-based quantum computing, and then there's a little aside about space-time locality and quantum error correction. And then you throw it all together, and boom, you get the result. First thing, stabilizer subsystem codes. Okay, so if you have NKD stabilizer code, right, you have K encoded qubits, uh, and you have some distance D, and you have N physical qubits. Uh, to get a subsystem code out of this, so to get a, a stabilizer subsystem code, Way to, one way to think about it is just to take these encoded qubits, right? So here we've encoded some qubits into these physical qubits. But let's say we don't care, you know, like I really only want to store one qubit of, of quantum information, right? So what do I do? I can say, well, I don't care what happens to these other ones over here. If it rains on them and it pours on them, I don't care. Let's just split them off, right? And I'm going to care about k prime encoded qubits. So I'm going to care about some of them. And these ones over here, I'm not going to care about what happens to them, right? They're encoded qubits, so they mean that to physically operate on them, you can't just you know, do one single x or one single z, depending on what they are, actually. But you know, there's some other logical operation that operates on them, but you don't care about that operation because it just acts on these qubits. So this is the notion of a subsystem code. Uh, this paper in, in 2000 of Poulin does a, does a great job explaining these, these stabilizer subsystem codes. So here's an example of them. And so why are subsystem codes good? You might have said, well, you know, I had all of these qubits. I had k of them. Why don't I just use all k of them, right? Like, that's good. It seems like throwing away qubits is a really stupid thing to do, right? Tell the experimentalist you got your qubits, throw them away. But it turns out that that's not true. It turns out there's actually a good reason to throw away the qubits. Um, so here's, a, here's a, a subsystem code. So like any stabilizer code, we have our stabilizer generators. In this case, we have four of them. If you know the shore code, they'll look partially familiar, but a little bit tweaked. And then we're going to have these gauge qubits, these ones we don't care about. There are four of those. And then we have the logical qubit. Okay, and if you stare about that for a little bit, you'll notice that the logical qubits, if you multiply by gauge operators or stabilize operators, always stay at least weight three. Okay? Unless you get the identity, which we don't worry about. Right? So modulo the gauge, this has a, a, a distance three, right? And you only have four stabilizers here that you need to measure. And this has a, so this is a distance three code where you need to measure these four stabilizers. So you need to measure fewer stabilizers than, say, the shore code, which also has nine qubits, right? But there's an even neater property, which is that you can measure these operators in kind of a clever way by doing a series of two qubit measurements. So the way you do this is, if you go back on that previous slide, there were gauge qubits. This is one gauge qubit. This is another gauge qubit. And then this thing in the middle here is a product of two gauge qubits and a stabilizer. So those gauge logical operators, there was one here, one here, and then this one is a product of those two times S1. So in order to measure S1, what you can do is you can measure this gauge qubit, you can measure this gauge qubit, and then you can measure this, these two qubits here, and take their product and you'll get S1. Now, when you do that for the Z operators, you're going to be measuring like Z1 and Z2, or Z1 and it's actually Z3, they don't commute with each other. Right, so you sort of have to do this measurement here and get this result, and then you do the Z ones. So you're going to be messing up the information in the gauge qubits, but again, you don't care about that fact. Right? So having gauge qubits around allows you to take big stabilizer operators and shatter them into gauge qubits, right? and you know, something that's still that's, that's very local, which is the stabilizer times gauge qubits, and then put them all back together and get out the stabilizer. And those things don't have to commute with each other. Those, those gauge measurements don't have to commute with each other as long as you do you know, syndrome one and then syndrome two following that. Okay, So this is why subsystem codes are nice. You can, you can break things up. I don't have to measure a weight six operator now. I only have to measure a series of two qubit measurements. And that's, that's a, an improvement. OK, so now I'm going to start talking a little bit more about stabilizers. In order to, to sort of uh, understand this, I'm going to tell you about two sort of things you can do with, with a su stabilizer subsystem codes. 
Um, and there, if, if you find plane with these uh, codes, you'll, you'll get, very, you get very used to these moves, but I want to explicitly uh, point them out because I do them all the time and I forget that I, I don't point them out. So, so you have a stabilizer uh, co uh, subsystem code. It has some stabilizers, it has gauge qubits, these are the logical qubits for the gauge qubits, and it has real logical operators, the ones we care about, right, where we're sticking our information. So these you should think about as, you know, some you know, k local operation some, some, for some k, right? So some crazy real operator on the physical system. All of these are just encoded operations, right? Okay, so here you have stabilizer, gauge, and logical. Now one thing you can do in any such code is you can start think, asking questions about, I can turn the stabilizer into a logical operator. So I can pick one of these and think about it as, say, a z operator, or an, uh, over here, uh, and I've turned it into a logical operator. So now there's an extra logical operator here. And in order to do that, I've had to define an x0, which anti-commutes with this, but commutes with everything else. Okay? And use such a, you can always perform such an operation. In fact, it's, you know, it's kind of the, the fun thing is actually trying to figure out which one it is when you're sitting around playing with those. There's a, a similar operation, which is you can take a stabilizer and turn it into a gauge operator. It's the same thing, because logical and gauge are basically the same. Right? And I'll use these moves uh, as I sort of transform from one code to the other. So this is one code, this is a different code, and you can sort of morph your way around different codes to discover new and interesting codes. Okay, so that's, that's subsystem stabilizer codes uh, in, in uh, about seven minutes. So uh, the next step in order to understand these new codes is measurement-based quantum computing. Of course, I'm always embarrassed to talk about measurement-based quantum computing when Robert Rausendorf's in the audience. But uh, anyways, uh, Robert, you could not pay attention right now. Uh, so how does measurement-based quantum computing work for those who don't, don't remember? So the idea is that you have some circuit up here and you want to enact that circuit. And the way you do it in measurement-based quantum computing is very clever. What you do is you begin by creating this entangled state, this, this so-called uh, graph state, cluster state. Uh, and, and then you, once you've created this entangled state, you start consuming it. And you start consuming it by making measurements to enact different things. And then you start doing conditional measurements. So these are all single qubit measurements on these qubits as you sort of consume this entangled state. And it presses the information through the system until eventually, at the end, you can do a measurement on the last qubits here, say, which does a readout of, these, of, of this system. Okay, so you create this entangled state uh, uh, that's you know, sort of entangled uh, on this graph. And then you start doing me single qubit measurements. And you may have to adapt those as you go along, uh, depending on previous measurement results. But you sort of push the information across the system. And you can enact a, a quantum circuit doing this. Okay, it's a very clever shirt. It's, uh, 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 trick. Okay, so um, what's nice about this also is that it turns out that the code, initial entangled state, is very local on this graph. It's the stabilizer of these vertex operators that I'll show in a second, which have x on the operator and z surrounding it. So it's a nice local stabilizer code. And the measurements you do are also local, right? They're just single qubit measurements. Okay, so these are very, on, you know, if this graph is, you know, is, is, you know, some lattice or something, then it, it's very sort of a nice local description of, 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 of how this works. And that inspires sort of thinking about what's the code underlying this measurement-based quantum computing. So I'll introduce this by talking about a wire. So in measurement-based quantum computing, if you were going to do, say, a series of Hadamard gates, uh, you could do that by making a line uh, graph state and then doing x measurements on that. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of work with that model, but I'm going to talk about it in terms of codes instead of talking about it in terms of the measurement-based model. Okay, so in the beginning, I'm just going to start with the, the, the code that, that uh, is the most basic one for this system, which is this vertex operator, which, like I said, is an x on a qubit and z on its surrounding ones. So if you have that for every single vertex, all those operators commute with each other. They form a stabilize, the generators of a stabilizer group. Right? And you're the plus one eigenstate of all of these, and that's the graph state on this 1D line. Okay? So it's a plus one eigenstate of all these stabilizers. It's a state, there's, you know, it's a code, uh, right, with, which doesn't encode a qubit, it just encodes a state. Right? So it's, you know, it's kind of boring in that respect, but it's, it's, so it's not really an interesting code in terms of shoving information in, but it's, but it's a state and, it's a, and it can be described in the stabilizer formalism. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about a new code. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this first stabilizer, the one that's over here, xz, and I'm going to take the, this xz and I'm going to make it uh, an encoded logical operation. Okay, I'm going to make it an x1. So that's over here. And then in order to make a, a logical operation, I need the, you know, I need the thing that it anti-commutes with, commutes with. It's encoded z operation. And that can be chosen to be z, i, 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 
right? Check this Z I I I commutes with all these, right? Because the only one it could possibly not add to you was S1 on this X, which is its X1, right? So this is a code where you have one encoded qubit. It's distance one, right? Because there's a weight one logical operator. It's not that interesting from that perspective. Uh, but it is a code, right? Uh, and the interesting thing about this code to me is, is well, is that, it, that is that it's sort of localized at the very left-hand side of this of this wire, right? At this point, the code is the the, the logical operator is you know you can get the z x operation by measuring these first two qubits an x z, or you can get z by measuring a z on the first one. So it's localized all the way to the to the left. But modulo the stabilizer, right? It's also sort of localized elsewhere, right? So remember, you can always multiply these operators by a stabilizer operator and get a new logical operator. Because you're in the plus one eigenstates of these, that doesn't change the value of these. So I could measure this by measuring these operators. Or, for example, I can measure right here, if I take S2 times Z1, right? That moves that Z over a little bit. And now it's a weight two operator, but it's sort of shifted over a little bit, right? And so modulo the, modulo the stabilizer, it's, you know, it's sort of localized. You could think about it as being localized to z, because you could get it there. But you could also move it over a little bit. Okay. So now, now comes the trick of thinking about subsystem codes. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to define, I'm going to take this next one, this xzx, s2, and I'm going to define a gauge operator. Okay. So I'm going to make it a gauge qubit. Uh, and in particular, I have you know z1 is that, and I have to find something which anti-commutes with it. Here's the x operator I'm going to choose, and this corresponds to when you're doing a measurement-based quantum computer, you're measuring the x operations to push this push the information down the wire, okay? And so this is sort of a gauge operator here. That th this is a gauge qubit that I'm going to operate. There's a, of course, so people who are long know there's a problem with this slide, which is that my logical operators now aren't correctly defined. Right, I have my stabilizer operators over here. I have a gauge qubit. These anti-commute with each other. These commute with all these over here. But these logical operators that I had for the previous slide don't, if you look at them, they don't, uh, right, there's a problem. X1, big X1, the logical X1 from the logical operator, right, anti-commutes with the X1 from the gauge operator. So that's, that's wrong. Oh, Z1. Yeah, OK. <laughs> yes, <laughs> sorry. Which one? Z1. There we go. Z1 anti-commutes. There we go. Z1 anti-commutes with it. Thank you. Uh, and so, so that's wrong. So I need to somehow update my code in order to make this correctly work to define the logical operators. And I can do that by multiplying this, uh, the logical operators over here by one of my previous stabilizers over one of my stabilizers from over here. And when I do that, I've actually done that one where I move it over a little, right? And it's xz. And now you can see that it really is sort of localized over here. Right? So now my x operator is, is over here, right? And it's sort of moved over. Now, of course, if I multiply by z1, it moves over. But that's a gauge operation. So technically, you can always move it back like that, right? But in some sense, adding this gauge operator really shoves the information a little bit to the right, right? So now, now to actually measure z1, for instance, right, I can, well, it's, it's hard to see at this point. We'll see it on the next slide. It's easier. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue to add gauge qubits. Right? And I'm going to do that by adding in these x's, single qubit operators here. And they're going to anti-commute with other operators. And I'm going to generate a nice gate set of gauge operators doing that. Okay, so when I do this, and I get the, all the way to the end, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all the vertex operators, right, except that one that I pulled out at the beginning and made a logical operator. Remember, I took that first one and turned it into a logical operator. That one I'm sort of leaving separate. Right? And I look at the, the, the group generated by these operators that are single x on everything except the last x's, single x's on everything except the last qubit. And then here's the stabilizer. Uh, I mean, here's, a, you know, here's the, the stabilizers that don't include that first one. And these generate a bunch of gauge qubits. And then the logical operations are these x1 and z1. Okay? And you notice now these x1 and z1s, in order to get them to commute with all these gauge operators over here, are sort of spread out across the entire thing. But of course, this thing includes single qubit x operations. So if you look at this, you can just measure by, you know, you can, you can, you can, uh, you can operate, you know, multiply this logical operator by these gauge operators and make this a single qubit x operation at the end. This is still a weight one code, right? But the, the logical information now is really sort of, right, it's, it's sort of in this neat situation where if I really want to measure this, how I could do it is I can measure a bunch of gauge qubits, which are just single qubit operations, 
right? And uh, you know, I have to measure this last one because remember I didn't add x to this last qubit, right? But in order to measure that operation, I can do that by a series of single qubit operations and measure this, and it'll muck around with the logical. Uh, It'll muck around with the, you know, with the gauge qubit, so we don't care about that. We can do that via a similar process here, and it'll muck around with the gauge qubit, so we don't care about that. Okay, and this is, this is measurement-based quantum compute. Uh, you know, it's exactly measurement-based quantum computing in that you're doing measurements, right? And you may know that when you're, you know, when you're doing these measurements uh, and you're, you're pushing this thing along, right, you sort of think about how the, when you're just doing X measurements on this, right, you're just sort of updating whether you're, you know, how this thing's occurring and you're measuring x operators plus or minus one, and in the end, the information comes out the other side. And it's the same thing that's occurring here, but this is just a, a sort of way to write this as a code. Okay. Okay, I'll skip that one. Okay, so let me skip ahead to something that's, that's well, let me, let me tell you real quick, and then we'll get to the main result and show you how it works. Okay, so I have to define something called a twisted graph state, which just means instead of making measurements, so in measurement-based quantum computing, you do measurements in this xy plane. Instead of doing that, I'm just going to rotate the graph state. So I can define a graph operator which you know has this rotated version of you know instead of x in the middle, it has cosine theta x plus sine y. I'm going to rotate at the at the qubit, right? And then all of my measurements are going to be x measurements. It just makes it simpler for me. Okay. So now there's this nice dictionary, which is just coming from measurement-based quantum computing, which allows us to take a circuit, any circuit, which includes preparations and includes you know, inputs that are, that are not, uh, not being prepared in any state, and outputs, right, and then different, different things like actual measurements here, and transforms that into a circuit that you would do on this twisted graph state to do measurement-based quantum computing. So you're always going to do x measurements. You're going to do these x measurements wherever there's an x in this constructed graph. A way to take a quantum circuit, convert it to a graph. The graph will be labeled by angles, which tells you the twist, and single qubit x's, which is where you should perform the single qubit x measurements. Okay, so you notice, for example, when there's an output, you don't measure at that last qubit, right? So the qubit information will be localized here. And here, you know, you are performing a measurement, and so there is an x here. Okay, so this is just the exactly the dictionary you would do if you were doing measurement-based quantum computing. But what, what I'm going to do now is instead of considering it as a measure-based quantum computing, I'm going to talk about this as a code. So now I have these, in this case, there's no twists, so you don't have to worry about it. I have the stabilizers for this graph state. When there's a double block like this, it means that you don't include that stabilizer. So that's like that input that I had at the very beginning of that wire. And then these are all single qubit x's, okay? And these generate some group, and they generate gauge qubits and also stabilizer qubits. Okay, so let me skip that just because... Okay. So if you were doing measurement based computing, what you would do, right, is you'd prepare this state, you'd encode your information over here because you have input coming in here, right? It would have to sit on these first two qubits, basically. And then you would perform these X measurements and it would propagate the information across, right? And you'd push the information through. And at the very end, you'd be able to say the information's localized to these last qubits over here without any X's on them. If you want to measure them, you could. Okay, that's how you would do it in measurement based quantum computing. That's what these five steps are. But what we're going to do instead is instead of doing the measurement-based quantum computing, we're just going to look at the code generated by this set of operators. Okay? And in particular, when you do that, what you find is that there are two stabilizers that pop out of this, uh, S1 and S2. One of these is uh, you know, non-trivial across these output qubits, and the other one's not. Okay? But what this really corresponds to is if you look at this circuit that I did up here, people who are experts in the, in the circuits will know that what this is, is this is uh, you know, sort of a, a not occurring onto here in some way of zero. You're measuring the ZZ operator. So this circuit right here actually measures ZZ stabilizer on these one and two qubits, right? And that ex explicitly cor corresponds to the fact that this stabilizer I get has a Z here and a Z here, okay? This one here has this weird property that it doesn't operate on, on these output qubits. What it corresponds to is that you, you put in something here and you did a measurement here and you know what that outcome is. Right? You know you're projected onto plus one or minus one for this and that's basically occurring in the, in the output of this stabilizer operator here. Now what's nice is, is, remember these things, I put all these things together and they form gauge qubits. Right? This is a big high weight operator, right? but you can measure it uh, via a series of, of lower weight operations. Right? Now in this case, the stabilizer in the end, because you know, these are gauge qubits, the single x's are gauge qubits, this is just a weight two stabilizer operator. It's not very interesting at this point. Right? 
So, uh, but on the other hand, you can measure it via a series of nice uh, uh, low weight operations. In particular, if you measure these blue vertex operators, you'll see that all the z's cancel, except these z's on these last ones. So by measuring those, those, uh, you know, those gauge qubits, you can actually measure this full stabilizer here. In particular, you're gaining access to a measurement of the z on these last two qubits. Okay. Uh, and just to show you what the logical operators look like, here they are. You'll notice that the logical operators, because you're now acting on, you you're, you're basically have this ZZ code occurring, right? You have a logical Z that's a single qubit, but now you have a logical X which is spread across here. So there's a logical operator, there's a logical X operator which actually has weight, you know, is, is distance two, right? You can't make this any smaller because you can't, you know, if you multiply by X's here, you can get rid of these, but you can't get rid of these because there's no X's up here. And if you try to get rid of them using vertex operators, you see that you can't, you can't ever get rid of them. You'll, you'll go around a little paradox and be like, oh, I can't get rid of them. Okay, you can't make them smaller and smaller. Okay, so let me finish up, I guess, because I'm getting closer. So um, this is the final insight, and then I'll show you the construction. Okay, so the final insight is, so we had measurement-based quantum computing. Um, and now what we need to know, what I really want is I want codes that are local, right? So... Um, one thing about quantum error correction, like I said, is there's no fundamental barrier to the fact that we have to measure this concatenated structure, right? Like we can make circuits that swap things around and you have to do this very cleverly when you're doing fault tolerance, right? But you can make things, everything local in space time, right? So, you know, these two distant qubits are, are operating on each other, but you can swap them around and swap them back, right? And do this operation between these two. You can swap them here to get this one that's, that's distance two. So if I, you know, if I have the, any circuit or, you know, and I'm laying them out in, say, one or two dimensions, and then my circuit goes up time, I can always make the unitaries sort of only act locally on this lattice in, in space time, right? So in some sense, the locality issue, uh, you know, is really I have spatial dimensions, and then in time, I, you know, with time in it, I can make everything sort of nice and local. Uh, so now I really only need to convert time into space, right? Minor detail, time into space. Uh, but that's what measurement-based quantum computing does, right? And this is this result uh, about making uh, fault-tolerant quantum computing local. Uh, these papers, uh, in particular this paper by Daniel Gottesman, uh, who is also in the audience here, uh, talks about how to actually do that. Uh, and in 1D requires next nearest neighbors, but that's actually not a big deal for this construction that I'm going to talk about now. Okay, so I'm almost done. This is what everybody feels like. I'm sorry, your donkey's been overturned. Um, okay, so here's what you do. So to construct this new circuit, you take that code that you, you care about, the NKD state that you're starting with, okay? And then you construct a fault tolerance syndrome measurement for that uh, quantum circuit. So here, for example, is a code, you know, four Zs and, and, and four Xs, the, the CNIL code, right? This is a, a circuit that actually does the measurement here. You can see I prepare some cats. Uh, I prepare some cats, and then I, I do some entanglement. And this isn't quite spatially local, right? I sort of, you know, have a long wire here, but you could take care of that. So that's sort of just for illustrated purposes. But you have this fault-tolerant circuit in space and time. Okay, so now what do you do? Well, you now convert that to what you would do if you were doing measurement-based quantum computing. There's some weird things because, like I said, there's this input wires and output wires. So you have sort of places where you don't include stabilizers, right, and don't do measurements. That's this over here. And this is so, and I've taken some liberties here. If you look at this uh, long enough, you'll see that I've sort of moved some things around using the simplification of measurement-based quantum computing. But you can see there's a creation of, a, there's some uh, operations between them, and then it goes off to the, to the side over that. And of course, I've sort of overlapped here and crossed wires. But if you, you know, do things nice with the actual locality, you're fine. Okay, and now what you do is you say, okay, instead of considering this as measurement-based quantum computing, think about this as a code. Okay, and take all of those X operators in that construction and take all of the vertex operators in that construction, you're missing some here, you're missing some X's here, and look at the group generated by that. It'll generate gauge operations and it'll generate perhaps stabilizers because those are going to correspond to the measurement outcomes. And when you do that, uh, the, the, the claim is that you end up with exactly uh, a code whose stabilizers have portions which are just the stabilizers of the original code on these output qubits. That's what we saw in that original little tiny construction. It works here, and the whole trick of proving this whole thing is actually proving that, that this thing ends up giving you the, the, the correct stabilizer of your original code on these qubits, modulo gauge operations. 
And again, there's this nice story about in order to measure this, because these things can, if this is a concatenated code, it's going to be really high weight operators. But to measure them, you can measure a series of gauge operations, which are all spatially local, because all you're ever doing to measure these things are measuring these, these local operations, right? perhaps some local operations here, and pushing them back. right? And you'll end up you know, splitting up the stabilizer just like we did with the, the original code that I showed you. So you profit. So what happens is you get this factor of n squared uh, in blow up in the number of qubits you need for this. Um, so that's bad, right? You get a lot more. But you end up getting this on some S neighboring uh, measurements. Okay. So I'll finish up here. There's, oh, this is, this is your profiting. Google does a bad job. I mean, I did label for reuse and profit. I don't understand what any of these people have to do with profit. But I guess it's because I did label for reuse. They're not very greedy, right? Person right here. So I don't understand that. But anyways, uh, so this, 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 this construction is kind of odd. There are some odd things that everybody always asks me about it. One is, why do you need a fault tolerance syndrome measurement circuits? Uh, the reason you need that is because you need to maintain the distance of the code, right? So if I construct the code without the fault tolerant uh, syndrome circuit, then there are low weight operators which operate on the logical information. So the fault tolerance condition is basically used to maintain the distance of the code. And then you say, well, aren't fault tolerant operations usually probabilistic? They are, like a cat, you know, you do this creation, you're, you may want to regenerate it. What you do is you get to sort of assume that you got the right outcome because you define yourself as being in the plus one eigenstate of those stabilizers that correspond to measurement operators. So you get to kind of cheat in some nice way. Um, there's the other question, do these codes have thresholds? I still don't know that whether the answer that's true. I suspect they do, um, uh, but I don't know. And then the question is, how local can you make them? Or this should be S neighboring. Uh, actually make them, well, yeah, S local. So you can make them S local. You can make them always the weight of the stabilizers can be made three local for all these constructions. Okay, and uh, they probably can't be made two local, though I don't know how to prove that. And I think some other results on uh, subsystem codes probably would push in that direction of ruling those out. So these can be made three local, uh, and that's nice. Okay, so the consequence, hopefully, is that you have this, uh, you know, this way of taking any code, lay it out like you're going to do measurement-based quantum computing, and then you can talk about how you make a measurement of these of these operators to measure this syndrome, which is distributed, you know, on this one boundary over here. And that should be hopefully useful because now you have local codes that are like the surface codes. Or like, uh, or like color codes. And this is still in preparation with my student, Jonathan Shi. Uh, and, uh, and this is uh, the product I'm working on. Google is supposed to launch in January. So hopefully, I'll have time then uh, to finish that off. UW, which is still going along, Aram Harrow and Steve Flamir are there. Um, so if you're ever in Seattle, please uh, look them up and, or ping me. Uh, and these were people who funded this research a long time ago. And that's it. And the test dog says, uh, no cats were hurt. Uh, during this talk, but they probably should have been. So, thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, Dave. I think uh, everybody wants you to come back. What are you doing at Google? <laughs> Secret. Yes. So, any questions for Dave? Did your salary go up polynomially or exponentially? <laughs> Secret. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? So you make those uh, fault tolerant circuits local with swaps, right? Uh, you can, yeah. Um, but in induction, you're using swaps to get something uh, in the measure, uh, kind of local for the measurement base. So you need to, computing. I mean, you need to do the careful swapping method, depending mm -hmm. on if you're in 2D or 3D. Okay, so you have to actually do the fault yeah, tolerant. Yeah, so, so when you're going from 1D, when you're taking a 1D co construction in, in space time, you have next nearest neighbor operators. Mm -hmm. So on the lattice, that will be that the, the things are just a little bit bigger than they should be. So it ends up not, like, in that definition of local, it works out fine. But mm -hmm. it's only because I use that definition of local. All right, thanks. More questions? So you are using sort of weight one uh, gauge group operators. How big penalty is that? You know, sort of general. I understand that in your construction you have to because you're mapping it to the measurement-based quantum computing. But how much penalty in general do you think that gives you? You mean how much? How much penalty in terms of the capital N? 
Flynn. I mean, the, in, in practice, when you do, you know, if you try to do, say, Steen's code, you end up with, you know, 70 qubits or something, right? So I haven't spent time optimizing it, but, you know, I, I think that's a good question, how to actually do it in a really nice way on a small thing. And I, I don't know what the answer to that is. It's a good question. Um, you make the uh, uh, code word much bigger, and you maintain the distance, but of course there'll be a lot more errors if there's independent errors on all the qubits. That's right. But, but you have a very large gauge group. Yeah. Would it be possible conceivably to turn some of those gauge operators back into stabilizer operators and get your distance um, or something like that? You could. I mean, I think what's, what's so th I didn't talk about this, but the, the most bizarre property of these codes is because you have so many gauge qubits around, uh, what really happens is the distance along the time direction is not really well defined for operators because they're all modulo the, 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 these gauge operators. So while it looks like your distance is really bad, because there's all this gauge around, you can't say anything about the threshold really from that. So if I were just, if I were just thinking about the threshold without that gauge degree of freedom, I'd say this thing doesn't have a threshold. But because of that gauge freedom, I don't think I can say that. And because these are using fault tolerant circuits, that's why I think this may actually have Think about, think about space-time fault tolerance. What you're doing is, you know, your fault tolerance circuit runs off like this, and you're just randomly poking in, you know, one of our models is we just randomly throw the errors in there. And if you look at the density of those errors across that circuit, it's really bad, right? But yet it still gives us a fault tolerant result. And so I think the same thing will happen here. That's why I suspect it has a threshold. Okay, I think we have to move on. But uh, before we do, I want to tell you, Dave, that if you come back, I will change my name back to Hamburger. Oh, shit. And we'll write a paper together. <laughs> it's brutal. <laughs>